messieurs, c'est un plaisir et un honneur d'être ici aujourd'hui et célébrer avec vous la vie et le travail de François-Alphonse Forel. J'aimerais remercier spécialement professeur Vera Slavikova pour l'invitation à cet environnement. Le contenu de mon exposé est la durabilité de l'eau, pensée globale, Agir local. Alors, même que je, pas, je ne peux pas donner mon exposé en français, la plupart des foliers, foliers étaient, étaient traduits. Avec votre accord, je continue um, en anglais. Merci. I'd like to begin by giving you a, a brief overview of the themes that, that I will touch on in this talk, and um, I hope that this will provide a, an entree into a, a discussion that we can, we can have following. So there, there are a few points that I'd like to bring in. It's, it's fairly broad, but I hope also to bring in a few specific examples as well. The first point is that we need to to have concern about water as a global issue. And there are global um, themes that run through this. But essentially, the problems that exist and the solutions that we will have to find, those are local issues. And you'll see as we go along how there is a somewhat a disparity between the global average and the local conditions in, in various places. Um, another point is that there are very severe pressures on the water environment that are a result of human activity, and there are also many demands that humans um, impose on the environment, many uses that we make of the water environment. Um, these are some of the more compelling problems. They have to do with the diversion of water away from the aquatic environment for other uses. Also, the issue of invasive species is a very pressing one. There is the problem of the introduction of pollution into surface water, also groundwater. And there is, especially in developing countries, the very dramatic problem of the lack of access to adequate sanitation and also to safe drinking water. And we'll see that some of these problems are, are connected to each other and that we may actually be able to find some solutions that are also connected to each other. So what I'd like to do is to show you some of the problems, but also solutions from the past, from the present, and looking forward to the future. And then I would like to introduce the concept, which I think is also very appropriate for the Institute Forel, that the solutions are not only technical solutions, but also draw on the social sciences, on economics, even on psychology. And at the, toward the end, I would like to give you just a little bit of a taste of some work that is going on at Erwag, but also other universities um, in the context of the National Research Program on Sustainable Water Management, the NRP 61. I think that we're all aware that most of the surface of our planet is covered in water. Now, of course, it's salt water, so on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe not so useful to us. But on a global average, we have a lot of water on this planet. And even if we think about the renewable freshwater resources and not the total amount of water, it's still a, a, a cycling of water on a truly massive scale. And this is illustrated here. We have the um, rain that falls on the land counted here as 100%, so that's uh, our input into the system. And what we can see initially is that of that 100%, over one third goes into the ocean. Right? So that we have this huge amount of water that's moving, falling on the land, moving to the ocean. We also see an interesting color um, coding on this slide between blue and green. And the green water here, this represents the water 
that's trapped in the soil or is taken up by plants. It's the water that we can't move around easily. We still have access to this water. And especially if you think about land use changes, that if we had, for example, a forest or um, a marsh area, and that were transformed into an agricultural area, we would be allocating that water to our own purposes, even though we can't physically move it away from that location. And it's very important in this context to, re to recognize that 80% of the agriculture in the entire world, and significantly more, for example, in Switzerland, is rain-fed. It is not irrigated agriculture. It depends on this green water. Once we have then 56% of the total um, rainfall is taken up in this green water, mainly agriculture and other terrestrial ecosystems, then we have a, a small four to five, six percent here that is um, water used in irrigation. And now we move from the green water over to the blue water. That's water that we can easily divert from one location to another, from one use to another. But what we see here is that while there is a few percent used in agriculture, there's about a percent that's lost in um, evaporation from surface water. There's a minute amount, only 0.1%, that's used for other purposes in, for municipal supply, for example. And so what this tells us is that with respect to a global average, there is not any significant problems with a regard to the availability of water. However, we know that the distribution of water in space and time is very heterogeneous. We know that at different seasons of the year, even in different locations, and, and even in a country as small as Switzerland, there can be quite different amounts of precipitation. And so the global average is not particularly helpful to you if you happen to be in a place that does not have rainfall at a certain time of year or perhaps at any time of year. So I lived in Southern California for 15 years, as, as Vera mentioned, and in Southern California, essentially, it stops raining hmm, end April, beginning of May, and it doesn't rain again until about the beginning of November. And so for that entire period of time, you have to be able to manage the fact that there is no rainfall in your local area. You have to import the water or store the water to manage that. And this problem, at least the geographic aspects of it, we start to see it here on this slide. So this slide shows us water scarcity, both in um, what's called physical terms and also economic terms. So what we see here are large blue areas. Those are areas where there is essentially no water scarcity. And we see the orange, dark orange areas those are areas of physical water scarcity, where there really is not enough precipitation to support ecosystems and human needs. And, and those are obvious places like the northern part of Africa, um, the southwestern United States. But then we see these purple areas. And this is, these are very large, of course, um, practically all of sub-Saharan Africa. These are areas of economic water scarcity. It's not that there isn't enough precipitation. It's that the society lacks the capacity to manage that water so as to be able to support the livelihoods of the population and also support the ecosystem. You notice that Southern California, that's where I live, right in there, is blue, right? It's not blue because there's a lot of rain. It's blue because there are aqueducts that bring the water from Northern California to Southern California. So this issue of societal capacity being part of the definition of water scarcity is very significant, not only in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in industrialized countries. And I'll show you a local example. This is a picture that comes from one of those newspapers you pick up on the tram on your way home, the Blick am Abend, just very recently. And it says, the Grand Canyon of Switzerland, this is the Rhine um, in Grabunden near uh, Flims, 
is drying out. Yeah? And so there is a consequence here for the um, ecosystem, the riparian ecosystem, also the services that are provided in the sense of recreation and support for tourism. But this has nothing to do with rainfall. It has nothing to do with, for example, climate change. It has nothing to do with the retreat of the glaciers. It has to do with hydropower, with the allocation of water, the diversion of water away from the Rhine and the use of it for hydropower operations. That's a choice. That's a choice that society makes. And those kinds of choices and those kinds of potential or actual conflicts of interest are critical to managing water resources sustainably. We hear a lot about climate change, and certainly climate change is a very um, real concern. But from the perspective of managing water resources, at least in Switzerland, it is not a driving factor. It is not a dominant factor. And that's illustrated here. This is the winter and summer rainfall um, past and, and projected into the future. This happens to be for northeastern Switzerland, but in fact the, the graphs for the uh, western part of Switzerland are almost identical. There is no Rustigraben with respect to um, this parameter. And what you see here is that up until 2020 and even further into um, 2050 or so, there is essentially no expectation of changing average rainfalls, either summer or winter. You do start to see some effect in summer precipitation about 2050, and then a somewhat stronger effect, um, but a slight increase in winter precipitation um, in 2100. And so, with regard to the Swiss water management, essentially, we really have to think about issues like land use changes, diversion of water for hydropower, much more than, um, than climate change per se. When you take a broader view, when you look outside Switzerland, that picture changes somewhat. This is a, a schematic that tries to show different types of effects, um, forest fires, sea level change, et cetera, ecosystem changes throughout Europe. And what you see is that the most dramatic effects are anticipated in southern Europe. In Switzerland, it's essentially the glacier retreat, but also some changes in the alpine ecosystems. And that is mainly a temperature-driven effect, not so much precipitation-driven. Um, so certainly there are some concerns about climate change in, in these areas. Also in, in Africa, there is, it, unfortunately, the situation can basically be described as the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Where there's rain now, there'll be more rain in the future. Where, there, where it's dry now, it'll be drier in the future. If we want to think then about sustainable water management, we need to think about the ways in which we use water and also the indirect services that the water ecosystem provides. So sometimes it's not always obvious. When we have drinking water, for, for example, here, oops. We have drinking water, when we have fisheries, when we have um, recreation, these are very obvious ways in which we use the water environment. But other systems like the protection of riparian areas, um, biodiversity, those are perhaps less obvious. And this is a, a diagram from the um, Federal Office of the Environment. So if we sum up a little bit this, this overview so that we're all a little bit on the same page starting out, we see that the allocation of water, the availability of water on the global average is essentially not a problem, but in specific locations, there are, can be significant problems, and in the future may be worse problems, um, that have a spatial and temporal dimension to them. We also see that there are actual and potential conflicts um, between different uses of water, and those have to be resolved. Um, and that's not necessarily an easy thing to do. And we face, essentially, a very large challenge going forward that we need to meet 
the direct human needs for water. People need to have clean drinking water. They need to have sanitation. At the same time, we can't compromise the capacity of the water environment to provide critical ecosystem services. And so the challenge then going forward is how do we manage our um, aquatic environment sustainably and how do we reduce the impact that our society has on the water environment. What I'd like to do now is to show you a few examples, a, a little bit more detail into some of the pressing problems. One has to do with um, the invasive species and the loss of native species. And here you see a map showing different introduction of invasive an aquatic animals, particularly zebra mussel and a uh, particular type of, of gamerous. And you see that this is not a new problem. This is a problem that is only now in Europe gaining a certain um, level of visibility, but it has been around for a long time. We had um, this introduction of these species in the mid 1800s. And in fact, Professor Forel had a great concern with this. This is a picture of Professor Forel and his team on Lake Geneva looking at an, an invasive uh, macrophyte, large algae, that had been introduced in the local uh, surrounding ponds and streams to support fisheries, and then essentially migrated into the lake and, and colonized the lake as well. And so this is a, a problem that has been around for a long time, um, even though it's, it's only now really um, gaining a, a lot of visibility. Another issue that is has been in the past, and we'll see that again, a uh, problem in industrialized countries is now more of a problem in developing and emerging countries is the eutrophication, the overgrowth and overfertilization of uh, surface waters. And here we see a picture from China um, where it's even a little hard to tell what's the land and what's the water because the water is so green. And in fact, they could use then the scale that um, Professor Forel developed. This is one of his pictures of a way to characterize and describe the color of water um, in, uh, in a very systematic way. And he developed this for Switzerland. Yeah? So there was a time where you saw these colors in Switzerland too. Now you see them in China. Um, this is an example from a, uh, a developing country, and I think this is, is uh, India or Indonesia, where because of poor sanitation practices, you have a direct introduction of untreated waste material into receiving waters, which is clearly compromises both the quality of the receiving water and also human health. And this is something we see very clearly in this slide. Um, diarrheal disease is one of the major causes of death for children under five in developing countries. This is, um, essentially due to poor sanitation and contaminated drinking water. And you see here the, um, the number of, of deaths uh, per 100,000 that are due to poor hygiene. And again, very dramatic effects in sub-Saharan Africa and also parts of Asia. And so if we can gain uh, improved sanitation practices, we can not only protect human health, but also the environment. This is, again, going back, and this is a picture from um, Lake Zurich. So in, at this time, around the mid-1950s, there were these very uh, dramatic problems of eutrophication, even in Switzerland. And you see here this intense overgrowth of, of macrophyte algae. And this is due to the input of nutrients from the surrounding land, both associated with sewage and, and probably also somewhat with farming. And this problem has been solved. Mainly in industrialized countries, you don't have these problems anymore. And you see here how that happened. So in the period, the run up after um, the Second World War, you see a big increase in the um, introduction of nutrients, particularly phosphorus, into a variety of Swiss lakes. These are um, several different ones here. And you see concentrations increasing up to about 1970, that was a period where there was a strong subsidy for um, sewage treatment works. 
that would remove phosphorus from the sewage. And at that point, you did see some decrease in, uh, in the phosphate concentrations in the lakes. And then in, in the mid-1980s, there was a further prohibition of um, phosphorus in detergents, which is the main pathway for introduction through sewage. And, um, and then the phosphate levels drop off even more. So the water quality is able to recover from the past. Unfortunately, there's other legacy of this um, degradation of the lakes that is not reversible. And we see that here. This is the diversity of whitefish in Swiss lakes. And what you see here is the historical diversity. And this was, this was discovered essentially um, through looking at old collections in natural history museums. You see this very wide range of, it's essentially all one species, but very different forms and shapes. And what you see in these two plots are the loss of the total biodiversity and the loss of the functional biodiversity in various Swiss lakes. And in many here in the biodiversity, loss of up to 100%. What happened here was when the phosphorus, excess phosphorus was introduced into the lakes, there was a depletion of oxygen, and the habitat, especially in some of the deeper areas, the habitat was lost. And so these fish that were able to coexist because they were in different habitats at different depths, they were then forced all to compete with each other, and essentially some of them died out. And so we have a, a significant loss of biodiversity and even a loss of functionality in these systems. So even when the water quality recovers, the evolution, uh, evolutionary processes are not fast enough to replace those, those species on this type of time scale. So we still see this legacy. Now I'd like to shift to a problem for today We've solved this problem in Switzerland and most industrialized countries of introducing too many nutrients into the water. But we have a lot of substances, chemical substances, that come into the water because we use them in our everyday life. So we use different um, medications. We use different cleaning products in our home. We use um, different types of shampoos. We use suntan lotion, et cetera. And a lot of this, um, these materials end up being washed down the drain or flushed down the toilet. And once that happens, they go into the sewage treatment plants. And sewage treatment plants do a terrific job, in general, at removing organic material. And they also, to some extent, remove the nutrients. But they were never designed to remove these types of chemical substances. And so those chemical substances pass through the plants. And that's what you see here. This is a little lake, the Furchbach, and it's before the sewage treatment plant. You see there's very low levels of these different um, chemicals. And then after the sewage treatment plant, you see the levels are quite high. And that's because the, the effluent from that treatment plant contains these micropollutants. It's possible to install additional kinds of treatment in order to remove these chemicals. And so what you see here is the typical uh, biological treatment is not very effective, but advanced treatment, either ozone or powdered activated carbon, is very effective at removing a lot of these uh, compounds. So there was a large study that was done by the Federal Office of the Environment, together with Erwag and, and many other investigators, to put some of these um, treatment technologies in place at a, at a full scale. And and unfortunately, this slide is in German. Sorry about that. But what you see here is the, um, the ozonation tank going into a sand filter, various different um, sampling points, and then here's our little river. And the, um, <coughs> the effect of this is quite um, impressive. Before the um, extension of the sewage treatment plant, before the uh, addition of these advanced treatments, you have this higher concentration, and after the, um, it, the ozonation is put into place, the concentrations are reduced. They're not eliminated entirely, but they are reduced. So this is a, uh, a 
technology now that the Federal Office of the Environment has determined should be implemented in at least some sewage treatment plants in Switzerland, particularly those where the effluent goes into either a, a small stream without a, with, with very little dilution, or if it goes into a lake in an area that is close to the intake for water, for water supply. Okay, now I'd like to shift back to the developing countries, and now we go back again, sort of, it's the, his, the history for Switzerland, but the current day reality in developing countries, and that is that the nutrients, again, are passing through the system, they are um, used in agriculture, the food products, which then contain these nutrients, are consumed, and the waste material in developing countries very often goes directly into surface waters with little or no treatment. What happens then is that the quality of the surface waters is very degraded, um, and of course there is also impacts on, on human health. There would be a terrific gain, not only in human health, but also in food security, if we could get off of this one-way street and close the, the cycle. So the idea here um, is of ecological sanitation is that instead of having the waste materials go without treatment into the receiving waters, there is some kind of treatment that re recovers nutrients and those nutrients are brought back into the agricultural cycle. And this shows a project that's going on now in, in Durban in South Africa um, with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and in this um, location, there's very little water. And so it doesn't make sense to install the kind of sanitation system we have where waste material is removed with water. It makes more sense to, uh, to install these dry toilets um, where the waste is separated, the liquid and solid waste are separated. And so you might say, well, then this is really an opportunity to recover nutrients from the liquid part of the waste, from the urine, that uh, the, the urine actually contains most of the nutrients. But unfortunately, right now, that's not being done. What's being done is we have this little pipe, and it just goes into the ground. And there are two problems with that. One is that eventually that contaminates the groundwater. It will take a while, but it will contaminate the groundwater. And the second is that you're essentially you're throwing away what could be fertilizer. So the idea of the project then is to collect the uh, urine and to process it to produce fertilizer. Now one thing, if you look inside this little shack, which you, you can't see from the picture, is that the toilets are very simple and they're eh, not very attractive. And this is really one of the issues with sanitation. It has to be attractive to the user. It doesn't help to install things and then people don't use them. And so another project that we're involved with, also with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, really addresses that. We want to make a toilet, this is the toilet, that is actually attractive to the user. Now this is an Asian style toilet. It's not the um, European style toilet, the sitting toilet, it's a squatting toilet. Um, but it is designed with water so that you can use that for washing, um, and also there's, a, there's a, a, a recycling unit that you can't see that is sort of behind this. But the point of, of this exercise is that you have to think not only about the, what do you call it, user interface as a toilet, but actually the whole process. How do you manage the waste streams after this? What scale can you do this at? How many families need to share this? Who's going to clean this? Right? These are not technological problems. These are social problems. These are psychological problems. These are my kid doesn't pick his dirty socks off the floor problems, right? And they are not going to be solved by engineers. So this is a place where we really have to bring together the technical solutions and also the social sciences. And that's what I, I tried to get across here in this, this little summary, the technology is necessary. It's a necessary part of the solution, but it, it's not the entire story. 
We do have, especially for sanitation and hygiene in developing countries, there is no question we have win-win solutions. We need to put those into to place. We have many technologies, that, uh, many of them are simple, I haven't shown these here, but many technologies for treatment of drinking water. Unfortunately, those are not used in a consistent way now in developing countries. And looking at that implementation is going to require that we pay attention to the political, social, and economic environment and not simply the technical aspects. So from this perspective, I'm, I'm really very pleased that we have at AVOG now signed an agreement with the World Health Organization to be one of their collaborating research um, partners. And, and this really embeds us in a much larger activity in developing countries so that we can bring our technology into a framework um, where it would be supported. And that is, um, we try to illustrate that here. If we have technical solutions, then we need essentially this enabling environment so that the technical solutions will really be implemented. They need to be economically supported. They need to be socially acceptable. And so these are also areas that we have interest in, um, in studying at EVA. So coming, drawing back out again now and looking even more broadly at water resource management, there are factors that are natural factors. There's the climate, there's local availability of water, precipitation, storage. But there are also technical factors. How much infrastructure is there? Are there canals or aqueducts or reservoirs? And then there are social factors. And these can, to some extent, offset each other. So that as we approach a problem in, in sustainable water resource management, we have to consider all of these different type of factors. In addition, we need to be able to support a decision-making process. And this is something we've been working on quite a bit. Um, I wasn't able to translate this into French, sorry. But the idea is that there is a structured process by which stakeholders can be given information, can identify their interests and their goals, and, and there can be some iteration if for example, that things don't work out the way you plan, that you can go back and um, evaluate the situation again. So now, um, sort of toward the end, I'd like to come to the, uh, the project, the National Research Program on Sustainable Water Management. Um, this has 16 different projects with um, partners from all over Switzerland. Um, Erwag is very heavily involved in this, but it's sort of our core business. And this shows some of the different types of projects that, um, that we're involved with. And what I thought um, I would do, instead of trying to just explain all of this to you, because the uh, Swiss National Science Foundation has put, um, I should say, quite a bit of money into um, developing these videos, I would show you just part of one. Yes, here it comes. This is in Swiss German, but with French subtitles. Wir sind hier bei der Kläranlage Elikon im Durtal und äh, wir haben hier äh, eine Situation, eine typische Situation von einer, von einer Kläranlage in der Schweiz und äh, die Kläranlage äh, ist darauf ausgelegt einen Nährstoff abzubauen, vor allem Kohlenstoff, Stickstoff und Phosphor. Und äh, auf der anderen Seite hat es aber auch Stoff in der Kläranlage, wo weniger gut abgebaut werden. Das sind sogenannte Mikroverunreinigungen, die vor allem aus den Haushaltungen kommen. Wir befinden uns jetzt hier beim Ablauf der Kläranlage. Das ist das geklärte Abwasser, das hier in den Vorflut reinkommt. Die Probe sieht optisch eigentlich sehr Sauber aus, also es hat noch ein bisschen Schwebestoff drin, man sieht da noch so ein bisschen Partikel drin, aber sonst ist es eigentlich sauber. Das täuscht ein bisschen, weil wir haben doch noch einen Haufen Stoff, die da drin sind, vor allem Spurenstoff, wo aus Haushaltungen kommen. Das können Arzneimittel, Rückstände sein oder auch Kosmetika, zum Beispiel aus Shampoo oder aus anderen Anwendungen in den Haushaltungen. 
Und die Stoffe fliessen nachher da in dem idyllischen Bächli in die Tour. Und die Frage ist dann, was passiert mit diesen Stoff in der Umwelt? Also, wie können die abgebaut werden? Und schlussendlich auch äh, bildet die eine Gefahr für das Trinkwasser, das nachher in der Infiltration von der Tour nachher gewonnen wird. Das ist jetzt unterhalb von Elikon, wo wir vorher waren. sind und da ist bereits das Abwasser jetzt in die Tour eingeleitet worden. Also ein Teil befasst sich ganz spezifisch mit dem Weg, wie das Flusswasser da in den Untergrund infiltriert und das ist äh, gar nicht äh, so einfach. Also das kann zum Teil senkrecht zur Uferzone infiltrieren, zum Teil fast parallel zur Uferzone und da im hinteren Bereich äh, von der in Infiltrationszone hat man ganz einen Haufen Messstellen. Okay. So this I should uh, mention, uh, this is Urs van Gunther, he's a joint professor um, uh, Erwag at EPFL. So um, maybe you have a chance to, to meet him sometime since he is often in this part of Switzerland. So if anybody is, has interest to see the rest of this video, that was half of it or the other um, videos or information from the NRP61. The SNF has a very nice uh, website, and the, uh, the, video, the rest of this video clip is there, and, and also, of course, the other, the other projects. So the idea of the uh, national research programs in general is to um, support research that directly addresses questions, important questions in Swiss society. So questions where there, there needs to be scientific input to political decision making. And because of that, there is an attempt made at least to involve stakeholders, to involve water managers or cantonal officials in the process of um, developing these projects as they go along. And just last week, we had an event at Erwag with, um, you see here, the speakers, many of them, of course, from AILVAG or other academic institutions, but also participants from um, a number of the different cantons. And what they bring in is sort of the reality check. Are we giving them information that is useful or is it too much in the ivory tower and not um, something that, that is going to help them um, in their day-to-day -day work? And if what's going to come out eventually uh, from the National Research Project are thematic synthesis and then also an overall synthesis that should lead into some recommendations for politics. The projects are still going on now, basically through the end of this year and into next year, and then the synthesis uh, part of the project will commence. So just in, in a few closing remarks, um, I'd like to say I, I didn't put a lot of emphasis here on climate change with regard to water, but certainly climate change is a critical issue for our society overall. For water resources, it is only one of many different pressures. And certainly currently, pressures that have to do especially with the diversion of water are much more dramatic in their impact. Um, but we, we do, as a society, as a global society, have to take the climate change issue very seriously. Um, we have a need to satisfy um, the, or to meet the demands that we put on the water environment. We need safe drinking water. We need sanitation. Um, we need the direct services from the environment. But we also need that the ecosystem will continue to function in a, uh, in a sustainable way. And that is a real challenge that does involve trade-offs and conflicts. There's, there's not going to be a completely easy answer to this. There are, in some cases, some win-win solutions, and we should really go after those. In order to set our priorities and in order to make these trade-offs, we need a good scientific basis. So we need a, a sound scientific understanding of the processes and the systems, and that has to be based on observation. Some of those observations need to be made over very long term. And that's why it's so important, the work that the cantons do, um, in having long-term monitoring so that we understand the evolution of the systems, and so we understand 
how the water quality changes over long periods of time. We need to be able to model those changes and to, make, to be able to make predictions about the future, and we need to be able to support decision making within the society. It's very important to recognize that science is an input to the decision making process, but it is not the only input. And this is a, a, a process of, of decisions that have to be made in a broader context that involves the politics involves the economy, it involves the values of the society. Science is only one input to all of that. So that brings us to the theme, the theme here, which um, is a sort of throwback to the late 60s, early 70s, think globally, act locally, still a, a good motto for the future. And then I, I feel like I would be very remiss if I didn't make it just a small advertisement for the EVOG, before I close, um, we have two sites, one in, uh, in Dubendorf, which is perhaps not the most spectacular setting, but we do have a very interesting building here, our zero energy building. We have tours for visitors if you have an interest. And then we have a second site in Kestanenbaum, which is truly spectacular. Um, we have uh, quite a bit of information on the web. Every year we have a uh, annual report that is produced in German and English. And from 2011, which was our 75th anniversary, we have a special anniversary brochure in three languages, uh, English, French, and German. And all of that is available on the web, or if you would like a print version, um, you can request that as well. So I thank you very much for your attention, and I, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Janet, for sharing with us uh, the, your insight on, on these important questions concerning water sustainability. By the way, the view from Versoa is more beautiful than from Castagnoval. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now we have time for discussion. Uh, questions both in French and English are welcome. So, um, yeah. In, case it's in, in the cases of necessary, I mean, uh, there is also a translation. Donc, les questions en français et en anglais sont bienvenues. Je peux dire aussi, si nécessaire. Okay, so, um, let's start uh, here first, the third row, yeah, after the uh, Un, deux, voilà. Ok, two, <laughs> so, for the third time. Uh, respecting water in developing countries uh, and concerning the lack of water of some populations, Peter Barbeck and Nestlé took the lead saying that privatizing water would help people who, who lack of water to, to get this water. So I wanted to know your, your personal opinion about that. Mm -hmm. And again, another one is how do you feel the lobby pressure of Nestlé who finances a lot of research uh, in the scientific domain? Okay, so first the privatization question. Um, I think with regard to provision of water and sanitation services that it's best to have a fairly open a portfolio, that you don't say, well, just one model is best. You do find a mix of different models. There's fully private, there's fully public, there's pri public-private partnerships in many developing countries. And, and some of them can work in, in different settings. I think that um, 
there are clearly some problems with the purely private model in that you just can't make that much money off of, um, of, uh, of drinking water supply compared to some other types of utilities. It's a, essentially a natural monopoly. It requires a big investment in infrastructure. And in a number of places in developing countries where the privatization model has been attempted, it's been a, a huge disaster. And mainly this is more the model where um, a large company like Lyonnais de Zoe or Bechtel um, take over the, the municipal infrastructure and attempt to, um, to do the water supply that way. The Nestle model is slightly different in that um, they're interested in providing a sort of, um, well, essentially bottled water solution as opposed to a piped water solution. And, you know, I wouldn't completely rule out that option. And there are places where it's simply not feasible to put in a direct piping system. And what you have now are um, tanker trucks going into neighborhoods and, and delivering water. And you have also some, um, some governments that are simply not able to provide a safe drinking water supply. Um, but I think it, it, it becomes a very delicate issue to balance the interests of private enterprise with the human right to water. And so there's, there's, in a sense, no perfect solution here. Um, but I think that essentially the, the poorest of the poor need to have a, a water supply and their governments need to have this obligation to, to provide that. If um, bottled water is part of that solution, it's not, um, I think, a huge problem as long as, as it's done in a way that really um, provides the services that people need. Um, and so from that point of view, I think that what you need to do is to bring more of the, the people who are the, the consumers into the discussion to understand what does meet their needs. What are they willing to, um, to live with, or how do they manage their, their water supply in the absence of, of bottled water, and, and how would they, would they use that? So it's, it's, not, it's not an easy thing um, in any regard. I think there, there is a problem where um, there's a, there are predatory practices, and, and this happens. You know? there, there are times where big companies come in, they take over the, um, the drinking water system, and the first thing they do is, is raise the prices. And, and then they have riots in the streets that happened in, in uh, Colombia. As far as the, um, the funding for science uh, question goes, I have to say that um, Switzerland, it, it is still, I've been here now five and a half years, it is still remarkable to me the level of support that the Swiss society is willing to give to science and education. Um, and I think this is a huge tribute to the, the country and it's a, I, I think a recognition that Switzerland needs to um, subsist on its intellectual capital. That's, that's the big resource of the country. And they're willing, the, it's, they're willing to make the investment. Unfortunately, in my own country, in case you can't tell, I come from the United States, um, there is a regrettable uh, lack of willingness to make that investment, and I think it will hurt in the long run. Okay, thank you. Martin uh, Yildiz? Thank you very much, and thank you very much for this uh, good, good talk and interesting talk. My question is with regard to water quality regulation. We have currently uh, water regulation in Switzerland and in Europe, in fact also, mainly based on the scientific level of the 80s, with, uh, I think, relatively little progress. And my question uh, would be, 
where do you see the most profitable change that should intervene with respect to efficiency in improving drinking water quality? You told us about all the chemicals that are in the water and so far, the endocrinal disruptors and so far. Should, should the accent be there or where do you think can we reach a better level for not sufficient water quality but uh, as much as possible good water quality everywhere? You know, the, the difficulty is, that if, you, if you look at the entire world and you say, where are the biggest water quality or where are the biggest problems with res respect to, um, to water supply, to what, anything to do with water at all, where are those problems? You would not say those problems were in Switzerland at all, right? So from that point of view, we should just stop doing everything and go to other countries where there are real problems. Yeah. But that doesn't happen. <laughs> um, essentially, every country is looking within its own national um, boundaries, and to some extent, it's a, it's a relative issue. It's a, it's a question of what are the issues with regard to the standards in Switzerland, not how does Switzerland compare with Ethiopia. Yeah. And so, from that regard, in Switzerland, I think we have um, we have some issues that are not strictly comparable with one another, and so you have to make decisions about where you want to put your your investment. Um, the Swiss waterscape, if you want to call that, sort of the the surface waters, the groundwaters, the um, surrounding catchments, have been dramatically altered. The, I mean, just huge land changes going back thousands of years. Um, land being drained for settlement and agriculture, huge morphological changes, a real fragmentation of the river systems and a, a no connection anymore between the, the river system and the, the upland areas. And so the, those morphological changes, are it's just not possible to, to reverse them, um, partly because the, the whole water balance of the, the system changes and partly because we're not willing to give up the settlements and the agricultural land um, to, to give that land back to the rivers. There can be some restoration that's done, but that whole process of deciding what river restoration to do and where to do it and how to do it, um, this is a, a very, it's a big question that it will be a complicated one to solve. And the revision of the water protection law that was passed at the end of 2010, it does mandate river restoration, um, a, a very, very substantial amount of river restoration over the next 80 years. It also mandates um, an offsetting of the ecological impacts of hydropower. And so that, again, comes into a, uh, a tension between the interests now to step out of nuclear power perhaps to increase hydropower, how will you manage that against the interest of offsetting these ecological effects? With regard to the, the micropollutants and the um, uh, pollution of the of receiving waters, there are also different ways to go about this. If there is a substance that really moves through the wastewater treatment plants without being removed, you can think about putting in ozonation or powdered activated carbon the way I showed, but you could also think about not using that material. Now, if something is the one and only drug that is treating your particular illness, obviously you don't want to take it off the shelf. On the other hand, if it's a fragrance in a shampoo, do you care that much? And sometimes consumer labeling is the way to do this. Maybe we should think about having um, labels on, sh on products that say, this material is a hazard to the environment. It, it's not removed in wastewater treatment plants. And let the consumer have more information. So there are different ways to go about this. With regard to the micropollutants, these are not at the level we're talking about human health issues. They are ecological issues. And there are effects. We, we've seen that in a, a very interesting study that was done in the Experimental Lakes area in Canada 
um, with estrogen, um, estrogenic compounds where they were able to induce a collapse of, um, of the fishery there uh, by the introduction of some of these compounds. And so you do see ecological impacts. Um, I think that, I mean, some people think of that as the canary in the coal mine, as a, a sort of advanced warning for human health impacts, but I think we also have an interest in, in protecting the environment there. But all of these things do cost money. And the society needs to make a decision about where to, um, where to invest. When the investments were made in the, in the US for secondary sewage treatment, for example, you had dead stretches of rivers right below sewage treatment plants. And there was a clear public interest in correcting that. With some of these other effects, they're much more subtle and there are a lot of trade-offs. Thank you. Um, yeah, there is one question here. Thank you, Janet. Um, I read AOVAC News, and I actually read it in French to help me to learn <laughs> the new language. <laughs> I mention this because um, it's possible that I don't understand it properly. Uh, so let me start with some fact-checking. Um, you mentioned in your, in your talk uh, ecosystem services, and ecosystem services provided by uh, aquatic systems. Now, in one of the issues of AIRLAC News, which is about biodiversity, in the introduction by Professor Jokela, he compares the, the, the cost of, say, a disorderly exit from, from, from Greece, from the, from the Euro, you know, and those costs, nobody knows how much they will be, but they're staggering. They might be staggering. But he says, if we look at the, the, say the costs of the loss of biodiversity in freshwater systems over the coming 40 years, and assuming that the, the, the rate of the loss of biodiversity continues at the same rate as it does now, then if the cost for the, for the say, the exit from, from Greece would be the size of a ping pong ball, the, the, the cost for the loss of biodiversity would be the size of a football or more. So if there's so much anxiety about the, the, the unknown costs of a possible exit from Greece, if this, if this uh, number is correct, which is given in air like news, so my first question would be, do you think it is correct? But if it is correct, should we not, as scientists, you know, express a much larger sense of urgency about the loss of biodiversity, in particular in freshwater systems, where the loss of biodiversity is, is larger than any other system, should we not express this sense of urgency and and, and work much harder to try to stop this because the consequences will be almost, um, you know, not be, not, we, we would be unable to, 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 uh, to cope with the consequences. Mm. Yeah, the, so the monetization or the assignment of monetary values to ecosystem services, I think is, is a useful tool. It's a useful communication tool. Um, People respond to costs. They respond to prices in a, in a very straightforward kind of way, and it's a relatively comparable way to, to convey information. My own feeling is when you see some of these staggeringly large numbers associated with, um, with different ecosystem services that it's uh, <laughs> somewhat approximate. Um, and the fact is that we, we impose a lot of changes on the ecosystem. We've seen a lot of changes in ecosystems, and, um, and it is hard to translate that, I think, exactly into a monetary impact on, on society. At the same time, I think you're right, is that scientists need to identify where the most important issues are and to be able to communicate that. And for me, personally, the issue about biodiversity has to do, I think of it a bit more as a, a insurance policy. We don't know what kind of changes will happen in the future. We can make all these, um, these different cl global climate models and run these predictions for the future, but we really don't know exactly what is gonna happen. And for the system to have resilience, 
for us to be able to have a system that is functional as an ecosystem that provides the type of, um, of functions and services that we need, it's, it's safer to have this resilience, to have this biodiversity there. And I think that that is a very important message to communicate. Um, at the same time, I think we, we need to do more than just communicate somehow because there's been a lot of communication on a lot of issues, for example, on climate change and not a lot of change in actual practices or in, um, in policies at the governmental level. And so just communication is also not quite enough. I don't have an easy answer. Okay, thank you. Ah, okay. <laughs> so Janet, uh, you just mentioned communication and I guess as scientists we are pretty good at a kind of communication oriented toward a public we know. So that was my question. Do we, do we address and do we communicate to the proper people? <laughs> and um, who would be the people we should talk to? Because the, the lay citizen has already many things to do. Mm -hmm. and if it, you, even if you mark on, on some products that there's things that can be bad to the environment. I mean, they, they have so many things to think about. And they don't even have, some of them won't be allowed to buy the glasses allowing them to read, you know. So we, to, towards which kind, which part of the society would we, should we address what we know and express it? Well, I think communication is only part of it. One thing that is a very interesting question is whether scientists should engage essentially stakeholders at different levels, even in developing their ideas for the research. It doesn't help to answer a question if nobody is looking for that answer, or if the answer is somehow just orthogonal to the way that change can be made in the system. If you have the discussion with um, with officials from the regulatory agencies, perhaps with, with politicians, with the people who have to run a, a water treatment facility or wastewater treatment facility, you have a discussion with them as the project is being envisioned and designed and developed, it maybe is more likely that when you come up with something in the end, it fits in to uh, the, the system and is able to be implemented and changed. And this is, I think, one of the advantages that, that AIRVAG has had over the years. We have um, very close contact with the Federal Office of the Environment. Now, of course, they're not implementing a lot of things. It's cantons that have to do the real work on the ground. But it, at least the, the way that we develop some of our projects, it fits together with how Bof, what the information that BAFU needs to develop some of their regulations. And we have projects with, for example, the Waterworks of Zurich, where we do the pilot testing in their facilities. And, and the, the way that the project is developed is guided also by their needs. And I think that that level of communication, not we decide what we're going to work on, we do the project, we come to the end, and well now we say, if only you would just listen to our brilliant science, your problems would be solved. Yeah, it's not that simple. So you need really to also bring the science to the problems that where people are asking for the solutions and, and not where you have to persuade them that they want your answer. Hopefully that would work. Thank you. Over there, there is a question. Ready? Uh, Professor, uh, you're from uh, the United States, uh, and uh, there are news about uh, a very serious drought that uh, uh, happened, I think, is the first in, in uh, over 50 years. And uh, it has had uh, trauma, uh, dramatic consequences on uh, things like agricultural production, even threatening uh, uh, world food security, given the importance of uh, the United States uh, in world food uh, supply. 
there are people that tend to say that uh, the current agricultural technologies that uh, are mainly based on uh, monocropping uh, industrial uh, heavily agro uh, heavily agrochemically um, uh, fertilized uh, is probably contributing a lot to climate change, uh, let alone the pollution of the, the, the aquifers. Uh, what, would be, uh, what would be some of the ideas one could uh, propose in terms of maybe uh, influencing the future of the agriculture uh, technology in the biggest countries? Because it seems that uh, uh, there are big lobbies, uh, some of them uh, uh, related to transnational corporations that are in, in, in involved in uh, agricultural production and trading that maybe push governments in, into subsidizing uh, certain types of technology that are not sustainable for the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you mentioned a very important word in there that's politics. I'm not an expert in the food system by any means, but it seems to me there, there are two levers on this. There's the consumer level and then there's the pol political level. In the United States, the agricultural lobby is extremely strong, which is also true in Switzerland. <laughs> and, um, but that, that political level is a level that really has to be addressed. Now there's some, um, steps a, a little bit in the right direction. For example, uh, in some of the recent farm bills in the US, and I think also in Switzerland, there's been a, a way that farmers could set aside some land for ecosystem services, and, and that would be part of the, also part of the subsidy process. Um, but the, the system of industrial agriculture in the US is supported by farm subsidies. And this is something that, that goes back uh, about a generation or so. In, uh, <coughs> in the 1970s, there was a combination of oil price shocks, some, also some bad weather in the United States and in, in other countries, and there was a big spike in food prices. And at that time, Richard Nixon was president of the United States, and he went to his secretary of agriculture, and he said, this is never happening again, right? because people are very upset. When their food prices go up suddenly, they get very upset. And so the US switched their, um, their subsidy system essentially to now people can grow corn and sell, they sell it for less than it costs them to produce it. And the reason that they can do that is that the US government pays them the rest of it. And that's one of the reasons that we have so much high fructose corn, corn syrup in everything that you ingest in the United States has high fructose corn syrup in it. So at one level, there has to be political pressure, and this is obviously very difficult when there's a lot of money in politics. Um, but at the other level, people have to, you know, if people refuse to eat this stuff, there, won't, there, there will also have to be a response from, from the markets. And there you see rather different patterns in, in consumer behavior in Europe than than in the United States. And so while at some level a collective action is really needed, there's also an opportunity for an indi individual, individual pressure as well. But I agree with you, the, the industrial agricultural model um, is very economically efficient, especially if you have huge government subsidies. Um, it does not take into account the other impacts, um, particularly impacts on the environment, also impacts on the, the health and welfare of the people who work in the agricultural sector, and also, unfortunately, in the United States, especially animal welfare is, uh, is very, very much degraded. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would have a, a, a family father question. <laughs> Our children went to school, of course, and they were taught you don't have to waste water. And sometimes I'm giving uh, 
talk, lectures or courses to teachers. And they say, you see, the children, they, they don't understand the message. They say, we have so much water here. And uh, indeed, we are, we are using in the uh, upper part of the drainage basins, perhaps 5% of the rainwater. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have the feeling that we should um, say something different or, or have a specific uh, education or specific goals in education, whether we are in the pro pro producers situation, that means Switzerland or other Alpine countries and so far, or whether we are in uh, areas where there may be really water scarcity. And I have the feeling that uh, since years, in fact, the message is not, uh, is not very sophisticated, is not very correct in Switzerland. And I, what do you think, what is your feeling about that? And who should refine and uh, improve this kind of message also for school teachers? Yeah. So um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, essentially, there is no point in saving water in Switzerland except for one thing, and that's where, where does the water go when you're done with it? The water goes into wastewater treatment plants, and that costs energy. Right? So, the, and then the other thing is that a lot of the uses of water also involve energy, not usually in supply, but for example, who in this room took a cold shower this morning? Yeah? No one. I mean, they take nice hot showers, right? And so the energy is not the energy to supply the water, it's the energy to heat the water and the energy to treat the wastewater. And so I think that message is, is, the, is the message that it does make sense to conserve water even in Switzerland, not because of the supply, but because of the, um, the demands that, that come up, that are sort of ancillary, that are connected to it. As to how to communicate it to, um, to schools and school teachers, there are some outstanding programs in, in Switzerland. There's a GLOBE program. I know that's in, in the German-speaking part. I'm, I think it is also something here where I know that the, in the EPFL, uh, the Swiss experiment has a strong interaction with, um, with, the, with the local schools and they bring school children in and I think they also do um, essentially prepare curriculum modules that can be transferred to the teachers. This was done also in Zurich as part of the Competence Center Environment and Sustainability, and I think that many, probably all universities in, in Switzerland have, um, have programs that are designed for, the, uh, for school children and, and for bringing science modules into the school. I'm sure you must have that here as well. And so I, I, think, I think you're right, we need to present um, the correct information, because if you, if you present the wrong information, then eventually people don't take you seriously anymore. Thank you. Now there is one question here and then here. Okay, no? <laughs> oh, you take cold showers. Okay, very good. <laughs> um, okay, so I have the impression that somewhere there also there was a question or is it not? Yeah, okay, here. Um, did I understand correctly in your first or second slide that les villes et les ménages et les, 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 uh, use one percent of the water supply? So this is this is a global average, right? It's not one percent of water supply, it's one well, it's actually 0.1% of the precipitation, the yes. total precipitation. And but again, you have to remember that more than half of that total precipitation is transpired through plants. Mm -hmm. right. So it's, it is a very small part. When you're talking about this blue water, in general, the, um, the agriculture is using about 70%. And the house, how much are the households actually it's using? It's tiny. It's tiny, tiny right? Yeah. If you want, in, most, in any country where there's irrigated agriculture, 
If you want to do something about water, you go to the agricultural sector, period. Thank you. Um, maybe we have a time for last question. <laughs> yeah, over there. Uh, I'm just going to recall uh, just a few months ago we had another, another uh, Californian advocating uh, environmental uh, um, awareness who's uh, Schwarzenegger. And uh, <laughs> I'm just uh, amazed of the contrast between uh, events and uh, how uh, people, how we can see today that the scientific solution is just a part of the solution. And that uh, when you see the kind of event that uh, Schwarzenegger uh, uh, has made here and how many people, I mean, it wasn't even possible to enter the room uh, was really, <laughs> really attractive. Me feel bad, no, I, yeah. I'm not saying. <laughs> I'm not saying that uh, nobody's interested in your speech, but uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's really tremendous to see how the message uh, has reached out to all these people, whereas uh, it, it, in a scientific uh, speech, it's more difficult to, to for people to be aware of of the problem. So, uh, well, it's not really a question, it's just recalling of what, we, what event we had there and uh, how, how the politics also can contribute to finding solutions and uh, how we can put forces together in order to, 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 to change, to change the, this, this uh, situation. Yeah. No, I, I think that, well, I think you I think you're referring to Arnold Schwarzenegger, of course, his, while he was active in politics, that his draw is probably more from his uh, career in, in Hollywood. Um, but I, I think that brings in an important part. We need different modes of communication, and the more popular kind of communication is really critical. When you look at the, the readership of the Michael Crichton novels, which have a, a real science part to them. I mean, it's sort of skewed, but, um, but that attracts millions and millions of people. And I can tell you there are not millions and millions of people who are reading my publications. And, um, and so I, I think that we also need to be able to find allies, to find people in different sectors and especially in the entertainment and communication sector who have an interest in bringing um, important messages forward to the public and, and help to, uh, to support that. We shouldn't by any means you know, turn our noses up at that. It's terrific when, um, when someone, with what, for whatever reason they're attractive to the public, is providing um, important information um, that, that has a sound scientific basis. That's great.